morning class, this is the ECA 353 macroeconomics class. Today is February 8th, Tuesday. The class will cover the second of chapter 5 of your textbook. The topics of today's class include 1. Fluctuations in gross domestic product, which is GDP. Two, GDP as a welfare measure. Three, measuring nations' income. So let's watch individual video clips. Um, I'm just in the neighborhood, and um, I have a lawn mowing service, and um, I was just wondering if you would like your lawn mowed. Oh, well, I usually mow my own lawn, thanks. Um, well, it looks, you know, kind of tall out there, so I just thought... Well, I've been kind of busy this week. I haven't really gotten to it yet, but... You know, it's only $35, and I'm going to school right now, and I could really use it for my chemistry books, and... $35? Uh, you know, I think maybe I'd pay 15 to do it. These are really expensive books. Twenty-five. Oh. Is that your lawnmower? Yeah. <laughs> you really use that thing? Yeah. Oh, it works. I mean, it's guaranteed to cut lawns. Twenty dollars. Twenty dollars? Cool. Twenty bucks. Great. I'm not going to see this. Given how much I hate to mow my lawn, I think I just got a good deal. But I feel a little bit guilty. I mean, is she going to report that income to the Internal Revenue Service and pay taxes on it? Most likely, she's a participant in what economists call the underground economy. The term underground economy refers to any economic activity that takes place outside of government supervision. And usually, this activity is undertaken by its participants to avoid the law or to avoid paying taxes. One example of an underground economy are the activities that surround illegal trade, traffic in narcotics, or people who drive drive illegal immigrants across international boundaries. Another set of underground transactions are those undertaken expressly to avoid paying taxes. So when people get paid in cash like she is, chances are she's not going to report that income to the government. And if she doesn't, she's part of the underground economy. Another example of underground economic transaction is barter. If my neighbor comes over and rakes my leaves and I go over and paint his living room, our trade involves value for both of us. But if we don't report this value to the Internal Revenue Service and pay tax on this in-kind income, then we're avoiding taxes and are part of the underground economy. Now, is this something that we should be worried about? The underground economy may account for a relatively large chunk of the economic output of the United States. Some economists estimate that somewhere between 3% and 20% of gross domestic product comes from this kind of underground transaction. In the United States, this is even a relatively small amount of our economy. A country like Italy, we might be talking about upwards of one-third of GDP coming from underground activities. So, is it a problem? Well, first of all, any time a transaction like this occurs, taxes are being avoided. Consider then that in 1992, the Internal Revenue Service estimated that about $100 billion worth of tax revenue was lost because people didn't pay taxes on activities like this one. By 1998, the amount lost in taxes was estimated to be as high as $200 billion, and that amount will probably increase as the underground economy grows. So not only is tax revenue lost, but also there are resources tied up in the enforcement of tax laws, and the more people turn to underground activities, the harder police and the tax men have to work to make sure that we get the money to fund government programs and pay for public goods like streets and street lights and schools and so forth. So as people avoid their taxes, there's less revenue to provide the goods and services that government provides for us. Then there's all of the wasteful activity that people do to try to avoid the police, like hiding their lawn mowers and doing this activity after dark and so forth. Next thing you know, however, she's going to need protection 
for her property rights, where someone's going to find out that she's doing this activity on the sly and threaten to blackmail her and turn her in. Then we've got organized crime surrounding this activity, people who are tough, people who are strong, forming kind of their own law around underground activities, as happened around alcohol in the U.S. around the turn of the last century, and as happens around narcotics today. So we get that kind of stuff. In the end, there's a lot of waste that surrounds underground economic activity. On the other hand, there's a lot of innovation that surrounds it as well. People who don't yet have the resources to go and apply for a license and deal with all the government regulation can start their own simple job by getting a lawnmower and going out and mowing lawns for people. Of course, they are putting themselves in a position of risk and liability, but at the same time, they are making a living. And she's probably going to be discovering some new things about mowing lawns that she can share with other people. Innovation is likely to occur as well. So, while the underground act economic activity may create a greater dispersion of wealth, meaning that some people pay taxes and other people don't, this kind of activity can also level the playing field by giving anybody a chance to get in and, and try to make their way. So what can we do about the underground economy? If we're concerned that, in fact, we're losing too much money in taxes, we really have two alternatives. One is to uh, increase enforcement and go after people like her and her lawn business and make them pay their taxes. That involves a big expenditure of resources. The second thing is simply to legalize activities and bring them under the auspices of the government so that they can be taxed more thoroughly, as happened with alcohol around the turn of the last century. Now, legalization isn't going to change her lawn business. Maybe we should have more enforcement to make people like her pay taxes. On the other hand, if she weren't here, I'd have to mow the lawn myself. So you see, I'm in a quandary. The underground economy has costs for society, but it also has benefits. So I was just at the grocery store, and I got this dollar bill in change, and it says Lucy on it. And you have to wonder, where is Lucy now? And why did she write her name on this dollar bill? And you can't help but wonder where all this has been and how many people have touched it besides Lucy, who chose not to write their name on it. If you think about money, you start to be drawn into the way it circulates in our economy that it's been in so many other people's hands, and the next time I spend it, it's going to go into someone else's hands who's going to wonder about Lucy. Every time you spend money, you are creating income for someone else. At the grocer just now, when I paid for my groceries, my spending became his income. Of course, some of it was his. Some of it went to pay for the uh, food that he had stocked his shelf with. Some of it went to pay his workers, but some of it was his income. My spending became his income. And when you add up the aggregates in the economy, it must be true that in a given period of time, the total amount of spending is equal to the total amount of income. This is one of the most basic fundamental concepts in macroeconomics. And to understand this concept better, we're going to build a circular flow diagram to show the way that money circulates through the economy and the complementary circle, the circle of resources through the economy. Because money moves in one direction to pay for stuff, which is moving in the other direction. And you can see this more clearly when you put it all down at once in a picture. So let's build a circular flow diagram, and we'll start with households. Households purchases of goods and services is called consumption. And the households purchase goods and services with money. They acquire the money by selling their resources, land, labor, capital. And they sell these resources in the market for factors, the factors of production or the resource markets. The second set of players in our circular flow diagram are the firms or businesses. Firms or businesses hire the factors of production and transform this land, labor, and capital into the goods and services that households purchase. Firms pay for the factors of production with money. This money becomes the income of the households, which they then use to purchase the goods and services that the factories have made. 
We're going to look now at the interaction of households and firms in these two distinct markets. First, we'll look at the market for the factors of production. Households supply resources, and I'll use red to indicate the flow of resources. Land, labor, and capital flows into the factor markets from the households. Over in the factor markets, this land, labor, and capital is hired by firms who then put these resources to work producing goods and services. Now, the complementary flow to this flow of resources from households through the factor markets into firms is the flow of money. Businesses pay for these resources with money. And this payment takes the form of wages, interest payments, rental payments for property, and profits that are returned to households who own stock in the companies. So in the factor markets, we see resources flowing in one direction and money payments for the use of those resources flowing in the other direction. The other market in which firms and households interact is the market for goods and services. In this market, goods and services are provided by the firms and purchased and enjoyed by the households. So the resource flow in this direction is clockwise. The money flow is in the other direction. Households pay money for goods and services, and that money winds up as the revenue of businesses. And out of this revenue, businesses pay wages, interest, etc., over in the factor markets. You see now that we've got a complete circle. Money begins as the factories pay wages and interest payments to the households, their income. And this income then is used when the households buy goods and services in this market. Then it becomes the revenue of factories. So money flows around the circle counterclockwise. Resources flow the other direction. Households supply land, labor, and capital to businesses that transform them using their technology into goods and services that wind up back in the households. That's the circular flow. Resources in one direction, money in the other direction. And looking at this picture, it should be clear that spending and income are equal. They have to be, because this is a closed system. Now. We can add other players to our story and see how that complicates the circular flow. The first candidate for being added to the model is the government. And the government interacts in this uh, circular flow in several directions. First of all, the government buys goods and services from the goods and service markets, and the government hires factors of production, like land, labor, and capital, in order to run the government, hires them from the resource markets. The government pays money to its employees and other people who sell it factors of production, and the government pays money for the goods and services that it purchases to run the government. Households pay money to the government in the form of net taxes. I say net taxes because the government also gives some money back to households in the form of welfare payments, unemployment insurance, um, medical payments, and so forth. But on net, households pay taxes into the government in the form of cash. In the other direction, the government supplies services to households in the form of schools and roads and bridges and national defense and other public goods. Over here on this side, we have the same story. Firms pay taxes to the government on net, although some firms get subsidies from the government. On net, however, the flow of money is from firms into the government in the form of taxes. The flow the other direction is the government providing goods and services to firms. Not only do firms use roads and bridges, but firms also profit from the court system and laws and contracts and such things that are enforced by the government. So national defense, security services, all of the things that are provided publicly flow back from the government in the form of resources, goods and services, to the business sector. So we put the government here in the middle. Notice the government has a nice interaction and integration into this system uh, with money and resources flowing as you might expect. We can also introduce one other player into the story, and that is the rest of the world. 
The rest of the world means people in other countries who want to buy and sell goods and services to people in the United States. That is, companies in the U.S. and private households buy goods from abroad, imports. And businesses here in the U.S. sell products, exports, to people in other countries. So, as for the rest of the world, we notice that we have two ways of thinking about the interaction. We've got imports coming into our goods markets from abroad, and we've got goods going back out as exports. So the top arrow here represents the imports into the economy. The bottom resource arrow represents exports out. Money flows in the opposite direction. Whenever we import goods, we send money abroad to pay for it. And when we export goods, money comes back in. And there you have it, a complete circular flow diagram that shows how all of the players in the macro economy interact with one another. The main insight you get from studying this picture is that spending equals income. It's a closed system. It's like a set of plumbing pipes, and all the water sloshes around, but eventually the, there's only a certain amount of water in the whole system. And anytime you go to the store and you pay for something, when you're spending, money is going into the hands of a merchant to become his or her income. It's that simple. And in the aggregate, when you add up everything that people are spending and everything that people are receiving as income, the two numbers are necessarily always equal. Spending equals income. We'll be building on this concept throughout our study of macroeconomics. The circular flow of income. Income circulates between an economy's two main components, its households and firms. Households supply firms with factors of production. In return, they receive an income. Income is converted into expenditure, which is received by firms as revenue. This spending generates an output of goods and services from firms to households. This is the simple circular flow. Income circulates continuously between households and firms. The monetary value of income, expenditure, and output should equate. For example, if factors together own 100 billion units of currency as an income, and assuming they all spend their income, the value of household expenditure and firms' output is also 100 billion. Each time income circulates between firms and households, it creates jobs, spending, and output. However, some income may leak out of the circular flow in the form of savings. This reduces the amount of spending which continues to circulate. For example, if 20 billion is saved, then only 80 billion continues in circulation. Financial institutions have evolved to accept this unspent income in the form of bank deposits. As income circulates and firms produce more output, machinery and other capital wears out and new capital is required. This may be funded by borrowing from the financial sector, which holds the economy's unspent income. Investment spending represents an injection back into the circular flow. In this way, savings is returned back into the economy through investments. A second leakage out of the circular flow is taxation, which is paid to the government. When taxation is spent on public goods, merit goods, and welfare transfers, it is injected back into the circular flow. Taxation may be greater than spending, which creates a fiscal surplus, or spending may be more than tax revenue, which creates a fiscal deficit. Borrowing may be required to make public sector finances balance. In the example, 15 billion is withdrawn in taxation and all is spent, so there is a budget balance. Finally, spending on imports reduces the domestic income circulating, while exports is an injection into the domestic circular flow. Payments between countries for goods and services may balance, as in this case, with 10 billion of imports balanced by 10 billion of exports. 
However, import spending may be greater or less than export revenue, creating a current account deficit or surplus. For an economy to be in overall equilibrium, it is not necessary that each pair of injections and withdrawals are equal, only that the sum of withdrawals and injections equate. For example, if savings equals 20 billion, taxation is 10 and imports are 30, while investment and government spending equal 10 each and exports are 40. Injections and withdrawals are both 60 billion and the economy is in equilibrium. Aggregate demand can be understood from the circular flow model and is a sum of household spending plus investment, government spending and net exports. In total, aggregate demand is inversely related to the price level, with a typical aggregate demand curve sloping downwards. To see more videos, go to I'm going to share something with you that I don't tell just anyone. When I first took macroeconomics, I hated it. No, really. Look, here's an example why. I would come to class on Monday and scribble furiously as the professor lectured. Today, we're doing aggregate supply, a relationship between the price level and the GDP. Wednesday, I come to class and scribble furiously. Today, we're talking about the aggregate supply, a relationship between the price level and the GDP. Then Friday, I show up and scribble some more. Today, we're talking about aggregate supply, a relationship between price level and the GDP. Exam time comes around, I pull out my notes to study, and this is what I see. Will the real aggregate supply please stand up? Which version is correct? What I came to learn later in my academic career is that each of these views has been correct at some point in time. After all, what is a model supposed to do? It's supposed to help me observe, understand, and make predictions about economic behavior. At different points in time, if you looked out your window at the economy, you would have seen one of these three versions of the aggregate supply. Let's go back to the late 1800s, which, interestingly enough, looked a lot like the late 1900s. The economy was operating at full capacity, factories in use, fully employed labor, production humming along. When this is the case, that the economy is at full capacity or full employment, the society is at its potential GDP. Even if demand should rise, there aren't any more resources, so you wouldn't be able to get any more output, just inflation. This is why the classical model depicts the aggregate supply as a vertical line at potential, or full employment, GDP. The classical model fell out of favor when it no longer accurately described economic behavior, namely during the Great Depression. John Maynard Keynes came along and observed that clearly, with unemployment 25% or higher for a sustained period, we were not operating at our potential. In fact, Keynes argued that we had so much unused capacity and so many unused resources that if aggregate demand were to increase, we could increase GDP without seeing any inflation whatsoever. The Keynesian model of aggregate supply is horizontal. Of course, for the most part, we see that increased GDP is accompanied by some inflation. This is the intermediate model of aggregate supply. Which one is correct? Keynesian, intermediate, or classical? Well, as I said, at some point in time, each of these viewpoints has been correct. Really, they're all smaller pieces of a larger picture. At very low levels of GDP, where there are a lot of unused resources, we see the Keynesian model. At full employment, where we're operating at full potential, we see the classical portion. And in the middle, where responding to increased aggregate demand means an increase in GDP and an increase in prices, we're in the intermediate range. Over the years, as one model falls into disfavor and another takes its place, invariably, some academic who liked the old model will come up with a new, more updated version to make the old model more attractive, hence new classical economists and new Keynesian economists. Take the original classical model, for example. In the original version, the economy was always at its potential. Well, of course, you don't have to wait long to show that this is not the way the world behaves. Sometimes we're at full employment, but often we're not. Since it did not accurately describe the way the economy worked, the classical model fell out of favor. Sometime later, however, the new classical model emerged. 
Okay, so we're not always at our potential, but when we're not at that level, it's only for short time periods because the economy self-adjusts over time to get back to its full employment level. The story goes something like this. What if we aren't operating at natural real GDP, i.e. the full employment level or our potential? If our macroeconomic equilibrium is Q star, and Q star falls short of our potential, then Q star is less than the natural real GDP, and we have what's called a recessionary gap. What this means is that right now, at Q star, our actual unemployment level is higher than the natural rate of unemployment, so we currently have a surplus of labor standing around. In a free market for anything, even if that thing is labor, a surplus will correct itself as price falls. In this case, the price of labor, or the wage, falls. As labor gets cheaper, employers hire more labor, and aggregate supply shifts to the right. How far? Well, until the labor surplus disappears, that is, until we are at full employment or at our potential GDP. The weak spot in this argument is the flexibility of wages. Will wages fall as a consequence of higher unemployment? If not, the aggregate supply never adjusts. And what if Q star, our equilibrium or actual GDP, is greater than potential GDP? This is referred to as an inflationary gap. Remember, full employment level isn't actually zero unemployment, so it is possible to dip below this level. If our macroeconomic equilibrium GDP is Q star, and Q star is higher than our potential, then Q star is greater than the natural real GDP. What this means is that right now at Q star, the actual unemployment rate is lower than the natural rate of unemployment, also known as the full employment rate, so that we currently have a labor shortage. Any shortage in a free market will correct itself via rising prices, so the price of labor, or wage, will increase. As labor gets more expensive, the aggregate supply falls. How much will it shift? Aggregate supply will stop moving when there's no longer a labor shortage, that is, when the macroeconomic equilibrium is at our potential. Time to think. For the self-adjusting model to work, wages and prices have to be flexible. Are wages completely free to increase? Are they completely free to decrease? The reason that I bring up the different schools of economic thought Keynesian and Classical, is that they have a direct impact on economic policy recommendations. For example, suppose the economy is in a recessionary gap and you're a classical or a new classical economist, you believe that the economy can fix itself. What role do you recommend for the government? Should it be active and try to help the economy along or just leave things alone? Now, what if you're a Keynesian or a new Keynesian economist? You do not believe that the economy will self-adjust. If there's a recessionary gap, the economy will remain stuck in a recessionary gap. What role do you recommend for the government, hands-on or non-interventionist? Next time. Now, what were the three macroeconomic goals again? There was one, stable prices, two, low unemployment, and three, high and sustained economic growth. We now know that the third goal refers to the high and sustained growth of a country's income, its GDP. More specifically, the growth of its real GDP, which controls for any price changes. We want to be sure to look at real rather than nominal GDP because the nominal GDP may increase in whole or in part due to rising prices rather than rising output or productivity. Economic growth, then, is defined as increases in the real GDP. How do we know if real GDP is growing? Well, percentage change in real GDP, just like percentage change in price or percentage change in income, which we've seen before, is real GDP new minus real GDP old all over the old real GDP times 100 to get it in percentage terms. If the percentage change in real GDP is greater than zero, the economy is growing. If the percentage change in real GDP is less than zero, the economy is shrinking. How we classify a decline in the economy is a question of duration. If the real GDP declines for two consecutive quarters, that's six months, we have a recession. If real GDP declines for eight consecutive quarters, two years, we have a depression. Next time, business cycles.
Now, it's useful to know some terminology when we look at fluctuations in GDP. So let's look at the uh, level of real GDP in 2005 dollars during the 2007 and 2009 recession. You can see that it went up, and then it went down, and then it went back up again. Well, this is the recession. And so a recession is when GDP falls for two consecutive quarters, or for a six-month period. And that's a time where unemployment is rising and production is falling. Right before a recession is called the peak. That's when GDP reaches its peak. And you go through a recession, and then you reach what's called the trough or the bottom of a recession, or when GDP is at its lowest. And then we go through the recovery phase, or an expansion. And so we have a peak, and we have a recession, we have a trough, and we have a recovery, or expansion phase. And when we compare different recessions, we might look at how deep a recession is, in other words, what's the difference between the trough and the peak, or how long it was, or the duration, or the difference in time between the peak and the trough. Let's look at the recessions since the World War II. We have 11 different recessions, one of 1949, 1948, 40, 53, 57, so on and so forth, up until 2007. And we can see the recession in from 2007 to 2009 was very deep. The percent decline in real GDP was just as large as the, any other recession, and larger than most, than all other recessions, except for the one in 1973. In other words, we lost 4.1% of real GDP, and it lasted longer. The duration was 18 months. It lasted longer than any other recession. So by both measures, the recession from two, in 2009 was the most significant recession since World War II. Now, a very, very severe recession is called a depression. And it's the common name for a very severe recession. And we've had depressions in the United States. Uh, the most famous one is the Great Depression in the 1930s. Now, we've talked about GDP as a good measure of how much is being produced in an economy. But we haven't really talked about whether GDP is a measure of welfare. Now, again, it, produce, it measures how much is being produced. And generally, when we see increases in GDP, we're talking about increases in standards of living, and people are thought to be better off. But there are many shortcomings of GDP as a measure of welfare. First of all, you can't count and measure housework and child care. While these are very important services that are being produced, if they're produced in the home and not traded in a market, we're unable to account for it in GDP, so it's not part of measured GDP. Also, leisure. Leisure is not counted and produced as a good or service, but we, would ar we might argue that a country that has more leisure is better off. So if GDP is rising but leisure is going down, when we're measuring welfare or well-being of citizens of a, a, a country, we might say they might be worse off. So it's not clear whether an increase in GDP is going to increase well-being. Also, the underground economy. Lots of goods and services are produced in the underground economy, but since they're illegal, either because they're illegal practices or they're happening to avoid paying taxes, they're not measured, and hence not part of measured GDP. Additionally, we want to look at pollution when we're talking about social welfare or, or well-being. If we increase GDP and increase production, but significantly increase pollution at the same time, we might argue that we're worse off. How much are we talking about here? Well, the world underground economy in 2002-2003, estimates of how large this portion that's not being measured ranges from, in Europe, the United States, and Japan, 17% of reported GDP is the uh, estimated size of the underground economy, all the way up to 41% in Africa and Central and South America. So while we think GDP is a very good measure of production, it's not a perfect measure of production because it doesn't account for uh, household production and child care and the underground economy, it also isn't a perfect measure of social well-being or welfare because it doesn't account for leisure and pollution.
Hello class. So today we're going to talk about chapter 23 and we're going to measure a nation's income. So we're going to look at how do we measure income of a nation. And the way we do it is through a process or through a measurement called gross domestic product or GDP. How is GDP related to a total uh, income and spending? We're going to look into that. Whenever you hear the economy is growing, we mean that this number GDP is increasing. When we say the economy is in a recession, we mean this number is falling. So this is a very important number. And every three months, the US government calculates this number to see how the economy is doing. We're going to see what are the components of GDP. And we're going to see how is GDP corrected for inflation. Inflation is the rising prices that we see from one year to the next. And we're going to cover about inflation later. And we're going to see how GDP measures society's well-being. So gross domestic product basically measures the total income of every individual in a country. It also measures the total expenditure of every products, or goods, or services produced within the borders of a country. So for the economy as a whole, the income equals expenditure, not for individuals. For individuals, for some individuals, income might be more than expenditure, or for others, expenditures might be more than income. But for the whole economy, total income equals total expenditure, and every dollar that a buyer spends is basically a dollar of income for a seller. So a more formal definition of GDP is, it's the market value of all final goods and services produced within the borders of a country in a given period of time. So market values means that goods are valued at their market prices, which means that goods are measured by dollars or by the same units. So basically in the US, they're measured by US dollars. In Canada, it's Canadian dollars. In Britain, it's British pound. So they're measured by the same units. However, things that do not have a market value are excluded. So if you do housework for yourself, it's not part of GDP. But if you hire somebody to do the housework for you, then it is part of GDP. So for example, if you mow your own lawn, that's not part of GDP. But if you pay somebody to mow your lawn, that is part of GDP. It is the market value of all final goods. So the goods are intended for the end user. They don't include intermediate goods. Intermediate goods are used in the production process. So for example, if we're making a chair, okay, a lot of things goes into the production of a chair, like woods, nail, glue, um, different kinds of like um, paint and other stuff to make a chair. So instead of valuing each of them each of those products separately, we just find the market value of the final product, which is the chair. So GDP only includes final goods. And they already have, and the, the reason is the final goods already have within them embedded the value of the intermediate products that are used in the production of the final product. GDP includes all the tangible products that we have, like food, clothing, DVDs. They also have a lot of the services that we have, that services that we are using every day, but we don't, they're not tangible, such as dry cleaning, such as um, internet service, cell phone service. All those things are intangibles. But they have a price, and we pay for them, so they're included in GDP. GDP only includes currently produced goods, but not goods produced in the past. So for example, if a home is pertinent, if you bought a home today that is a brand new home that was built in this current year, then it will be part of this year's GDP. But if you bought a home that was built, let's say 1995 or 1980, that was included in 1980's GDP. So you, those things are not part of this year's GDP. So if you bought a certified pre-owned car or a used car that this year, that's not part of this year's GDP. That was part of the, G you know, the GDP when it was produced. But if you bought a brand new car, then it's part of this year's GDP. GDP measures the production of the goods and services within the borders of a country, regardless of citizenship status. So anybody who can produce 
within the U.S. or who is producing any product within the U.S., all those products are part of U.S. GDP. And it is usually during a given period of time, so usually a quarter, excuse me, or a year. So in short, it's basically all the products that the country produces in a given period of time that are intended for the final user. So what are the component of GDP? So GDP is also total spending. So there are four components of GDP. Consumption, in investment, government purchases, and net exports. So think about it. GDP as a, the income of the country. So income is denoted by Y. So what the, if we are, we are thinking about an individual, what do we do with our income? Part of it we consume. Part of it we invest, for, uh, we save or we invest so that we have money in the future. Part of it goes to the government as taxes. And part of it we buy stuff from abroad because we like to enjoy some foreign products like French wine or French cheese or Canadian maple syrup or something like that. So just like that, the GDP that we earn in the country, part of it is consumed, part of it is invested so that we can produce more in the future. Part of it is used by the government to provide services for us all, and part of it is used to buy products from abroad. So what is consumption? Consumption is total spending by households on goods and services. GNS is goods and services. It can be goods like actual tangible products or intangible products too. Housing cost is a little different. For renters, consumption includes rent payments because we're, we are renting or paying the landlord money to get the right to have the right to spend, uh, stay in a place. For homeowners, though, consumption is the imputed rental value. So it's basically that the homeowner is the renter and the landlord. So the amount that they pay as renter to the landlord, it's an imputed value. Technically, it's the same person. But that part is considered to be part of GDP. So basically, the landlord or if you own a house you're giving up you could have rented that house and lived on the streets but you you're not doing that you're actually staying in the house so you are giving up that rent so it's the opportunity cost of living in the house that is part of consumption component of gdp however the purchase price or mortgage payment that we make they are not part of gdp current year's gdp Investment component is investment is the total spending on goods that will be used in the future to produce more goods. So spending on capital machinery. So if we buy, if someone, if a company um, creates a new factory, that's considered investment. Housing purchases are considered to be investment. So if you buy a house, it's technically a house is a People normally buy houses yes, to stay, but it is also a big investment. That's probably the biggest purchase a person makes in their lifetime. So housing is considered to be an investment. Inventories, goods that are sold or produced but not sold, those are considered part of investment. However, investment does not mean, although we use this word that way, it doesn't mean that when we purchase financial assets like stocks and bonds. If we're purchasing stocks and bonds, that's... Although we say we invested in the stock exchange, that's not the correct term. Government purchase is government spending of all levels of government, so federal, state, local, city, county level, all levels of government. However, G does not include transfer payments, which is basically social security payments or disability insurance or unemployment insurance, because those are once they're not intended for the end user, they're just one-time payment. There's no transaction going on. Not a one-time payment, I meant there's a one-way payment. There's no transaction going on. And the people who get those transfer payments are using them for purchasing other goods and services. So it would be double counting. So instead of that, we're just considering, okay, just transfer payments. Just transfer payments are part of they will be used for consumption, so it can be part of consumption component of GDP, but they won't be part of the government uh, purchases. So transfer payments are not purchases of goods and services. They are one-way payments, so they are not part of the government spending. Net exports is exports minus imports. NX stands for that. Exports, as we talked about um, earlier in the 
course, export represents foreign spending of goods and services. So when a British individual purchases a Nike shoe, that's considered to be US export. But when we purchase, let's say, um, British textbooks from England, that's considered to be an Eng English, uh, that's when we are importing products from England. So when we add all those components up, we get GDP. GDP is C plus I plus G plus NX. How much is it? So currently US GDP is about $17 trillion. Out of that, we consume about 70% of GDP. We invest about 16% of GDP. Government is about 20% of GDP. And we spend about $500 billion or around 3% of GDP to buy other products. In per capita terms, so about each individual in the US produces about $53,000 worth of goods and services. Out of that $53,000, each individual consumes about $36,000 worth of products, goods and services. So these are uh, on an average. So of course, some people earn much more, some people earn much less, but on an average, an American earns about $53,000. About $9,000 is um, invested for the future, about $10,000 is paid as taxes, and about $1,500 is used to buy products from abroad. Now, there's a difference between real and nominal GDP. Inflation distorts the economic variables like GDP. So we have two versions. One is the nominal GDP, where we value products using current prices, and they're not corrected for inflation. And the other one is real GDP, where we value, price, where we value the amount we're producing every year based on prices of a certain base year. And it is corrected for inflation. So Anytime prices go up, and every and we're going to study it next uh, in the next couple of chapters, prices go up every year, and so we want to make sure that okay we are actually producing more and not just the amount that we are producing is being inflated by higher prices. So let's look at an example. So let's say we have an economy that just produces pizza and lattes. So in two thousand eleven. We produced 400 pizza at price, and they were sold at $10. In 2012, price rose to 11 In 2013, price rose to $12. Latte is the same thing. Price is $2, $2.50, and $3 for each of those years, and the quantities are listed. Now, if we wanted to find nominal GDP, so in 2011, the total value of pizza was 400 pizza was being produced times 10, which is $10 per pizza, and the price of latte was $2, and 1,000 units of lattes were sold. So in total, you have $6,000 worth of goods and services, final goods and services being produced in this economy in a given in one year. In 2012, it is 11 times 500 plus 250 times 1,100. So it's 8,250. In 2013, it is 10,800. So now, in this case, if I'm a policymaker and I'm saying, all right, from 2011 to 2012, prices went up, by, our GDP went up by 37.5%. However, the problem is, I could have just raised GDP by just raising prices. I'm not sure, is did the GDP go up because prices are going up? Or is it because I'm actually producing more? Okay, you could have higher prices and still produce the same amount, and it would show that your GDP is going up. So is that right? So in that case, we have to, so what we do then to get around that is we consider, all right, let's think that prices are constant. If we hold prices constant, then what happens to G GDP? So let's say that we're holding 2011 as base year. You can hold any year as base year. You could hold 2013 as base year or 2012 as base year. But for this example, we're using 2011 as base year, which means that we're holding prices to be constant at 2011 prices. So now in 2011, what is my GDP? Um, 
it is 10 times 400 plus 2 times 1,000, which is 6,000. So in 2012 now, what is GDP? We're holding 2011 prices, but we're using this, multiplying this by 500. And we're using $2 and multiplying this by 1,100. So we're not considering 2012 prices, we're considering 2011 prices. Same thing with 2013, we're not holding 2013 prices, but we're using 2011 prices to calculate GDP. Now in this case, we can see, look, the prices are held constant. So the only reason why these numbers are going up is because we're actually producing more. So the quantity that we're producing of both pizza or latte is actually going up. Now if I say that, if I measure the percentage change, which is 20%, now I can say that, all right, now I know that I'm producing 20% more goods and services in this economy between 2011 and 12. Between 2012 and 13, I'm producing 16.7% more goods and services. Since we held prices constant, we can now say that that increase is mainly because we're producing more. So in each year, GDP is, so this is just, we got it from that number, from the previous exercise. Nominal GDP measure is measured using current prices. Real GDP is measured using constant prices from a base year. And in our example, it is 2011. The change in nominal GDP reflects both prices and quantities. However, the change in real GDP, only it's only measuring the increases in quantity. So we're holding prices as constant. So of course, changes in real GDP will be lower than changes in nominal GDP for the most part. But we do see that, okay, now if I look at real GDP increasing, I can say that yes, we're producing more goods. So real GDP is corrected for inflation or rise in prices. This is how nominal and real GDP looks like. So over time, US economy has been doing well. Um, this period from 1990 till 2000, this has been the longest period of economic expansion the U.S. has ever seen. Um, the U.S. was not doing so well here. This is the early 1980s, and this is the Great Recession that we saw. Now, GDP deflator is an overall measure of prices. One way of measuring how prices change from one year to the next is using GDP deflator. The definition is this nominal GDP over real GDP times 100 is GDP deflator. Students always make the mistake, they put real on top, nominal on the bottom, but it's always nominal GDP on top. So one way to measure inflation is to measure the percentage change of GDP deflator from one year to the next. So in this case, for the base year, GDP deflator is always going to be 100. For 2012, it is 8,250 divided by 7,200, which is times 100, which comes out to be 14, 114. For 2013, it is 10,800 divided by 8,400 times 100. Now, if I want to calculate inflation rate, I just calculate the percentage change of GDP deflator from one year to the next. So for this year, this would be 128.6 minus 114.6 divided by 114.6 times 100. And that should give you 12.2%. Now, how important is GDP? Real GDP per capita is what we use to, to understand or to measure the average person's standard of living in a country. So when we say a country is a rich country, we mean that the GDP per person or GDP per capita is high or low. So the richest country in the world we say is either Qatar or Luxembourg. They're, on an average, each person there earns about $100,000. In America, it's about $55,000. Some of the poorest countries in the world are, one is Congo, where an average person earns about $300 per year. 
So by that, we using GDP per capita, we measure how rich or poor a country is. However, GDP is not the perfect measure of well-being. Uh, Senator Robert Kennedy, he actually was a very harsh critic, uh, critic of the GDP, and he had a very eloquent statement why GDP is not good. So he says that GDP does not allow for the health of our children, the quality of our education, or the joy of their play. It does not include the beauty of their own poetry, the strength of our marriages, and the intelligence of our public debates, or the integrity of our public officials. It measures neither our courage, nor our wisdom, or devotion. It measures everything, in short, that which makes life worthwhile, and it can tell us everything about America except why we are proud that we are Americans. So what does that mean? Well, GDP does not value the quality of the environment. So you could have a high income but live in a very polluted neighborhood, and GDP will still think that you're a wealthy person. It does not measure leisure time. Some countries might have, like in France, um, their work week is much lower. It's 30 to 35 hours per week, but their GDP per capita is pretty similar to other countries where uh, some countries like um, Germany or England where they work much longer. So how do you measure that? Well, France, the French people have more leisure time, so they should have but that is not part included into GDP because we don't value leisure using dollar amounts. Non-market activities such as child care is not part of GDP. So if a um, parent reads a book to the child, that's not part of GDP. But if a parent hires somebody to read, to read to the child, that would be part of GDP. Or an equitable distribution of income. How is income distributed in the society? And GDP does not value that. A person can have all the money and the rest of the people may have no money and you would still have a pretty high GDP. So this is all we have from chapter 23. It's a very short chapter. It basically just introduces how do we measure GDP. And so in the next chapters, we're going to learn some more about macroeconomics. Okay, well, have a good rest of the day. The first question that any economic system must answer is this. What goods will be produced? That is, what combination of the possible goods and services will be produced in this economy? In order to summarize the possible combinations of goods and services that can be produced, the economist needs a tool. And the tool that we use is called the production possibilities frontier. Production possibilities, what it's possible to produce. The production possibilities frontier shows all combinations of goods and services that it's possible to produce in this economy given its resource endowment, that is the amount of capital, labor, and raw materials available, and given its technology, that is its know-how for transforming raw materials into final goods and services. The production possibilities frontier will show you the maximum amount of one good that the economy can produce given the amount of other goods that it's already producing, and given its resource and technological constraints. I'm going to draw now a production possibilities frontier for a sample economy. And because this is macroeconomics, instead of using two goods like apples and oranges, we're going to use aggregate goods, that is, goods that are actually a broad class of a type of good. The two types of goods that we'll use are consumption goods, and investment goods. Let me first define, a consumption good is a good or service that provides immediate satisfaction for its own sake. For instance, an example of a consumption good is clothing, or food, or perhaps uh, entertainment, or uh, medical care, things that provide you with satisfaction right now. These are the consumption goods. And on the horizontal axis of my production possibilities graph, I'm going to measure the quantity of consumption goods that are produced in this economy. Now, you're asking, well, what is this? Is this shirts? Is this medical care? Is this food? What is it? Well, what it actually is is an aggregate. 
we've made up some kind of measure of consumption goods in general. Think of this as the number of baskets of consumption goods. And in each basket, there's a little bit of food, a little bit of clothing, a little bit of medical care. And the numbers here on the horizontal axis represent the number of those baskets, an aggregate measure of consumer goods available in this economy. On the vertical axis, we're going to measure the quantity of investment goods. Investment goods are sometimes called capital or tools. These are goods that produce other goods. An example is a sewing machine. Another example might be a drill press. Another example might be a factory. Anything that actually is valuable because it produces other things is a capital good or a tool or an investment good. I'm going to use here the letter I to stand for investment goods. And something you'll learn very quickly in macroeconomics is that when we say investment, we're talking about the spending, the purchases of businesses. Investment is business spending. And on the vertical axis here, I've uh, calibrated numbers that represent the overall quantity of investment goods produced in our economy. So once again, we're thinking of this as baskets, representative measures of tools. So there's a little bit of sewing machine, a little bit of drill press, a little bit of factory in each of these baskets. And we're going to produce 25, 50, 75, 100, or so forth. So on my two axes, I am measuring the quantities of things that are valuable in our economy. On the horizontal, we have consumption goods represented by the letter C. And on the vertical axis, we have investment goods or capital or tools represented by the letter I. Now, what are our production possibilities? That depends. It depends on the quantity of resources we have, land, labor, tools to use. And it depends also on our technology, our know-how, or our ability to translate these raw materials into final goods and services. I'm going to represent these possibilities first with a table of numbers. We can call this table the production possibilities schedule. As you look at these numbers, you'll see the maximum quantity of consumer goods that can be produced for any given quantity of investment goods produced. So for instance, whenever we're producing 100 bundles of investment goods, we're using up all of the resources in our economy, and we have nothing left to produce consumer goods with. We can take that piece of information and move over into our graph and find a point that shows us our output when we devote all of our resources to the production of investment goods. And that's this point right here, 100 bundles of investment goods and no consumer goods at all. That's a point then on the vertical axis. The next combination listed in the table has 75 investment goods and 100 consumer goods. Let's think about what this means. If we are willing to give up 25 bundles of investment goods, we will free up land, labor, and capital. We will free up resources that will allow us to produce 100 units of consumer goods. That is, these resources that were being used to produce tools have an opportunity cost. You can either have 25 extra tools or you can have 100 new consumer goods. The opportunity cost of this 100 units of consumer goods is the 25 tools that we must give up in order to produce them. We, pr we stop producing the tools that frees resources that are then diverted into the production of consumer goods. And we can show that as this new point on the production possibilities frontier. The combination here is 75 tools and 100 bundles of consumer goods. Let's continue this line of thinking as we look at the next combination on the schedule. 50 units of investment good and 150 units of consumer goods. Now, the opportunity cost of getting an additional 50 units of consumer goods is 25 tools. Give up 25 tools, and now you can get an additional 50 units of consumer goods for a combination of 150 consumer goods and 50 investment goods. Well, notice what's happened here. The first 25 tools we were willing to do without bought us 100 consumer goods. The next time we give up 25 tools, we only get an additional output of 50 consumer goods. What's going on? Well, this is a matter of increasing opportunity cost. That is, the first time we cut back our production of sewing machines and other tools, we did so by freeing the resources that are best suited for the production of clothing. 
That is, we took the resources that could most easily be transformed into consumer goods and we let them go first as we reduced our output of tools. Now, if we want to reduce the output of tools further, we're taking resources that aren't quite as well suited for the production of consumer goods as the first set. So maybe the first time we let go of cloth, we let go of labor that was talented in the production of clothing, and we sent them over to produce consumer goods instead. Now we've got workers that know a lot more about tools and not quite as much about producing clothing. And whenever we move them from the tool sector into the consumption sector, they don't add as much additional output as the workers that we first transferred. So you can see we have an increasing opportunity cost because some resources are better suited to the production of tools and other resources are better suited to the production of consumer goods. Let's continue this logic by looking at the next point in the schedule, 25 units of tools and 170 units of consumer goods. Now, whenever we let go of another 25 units of tools, that is, whenever we cut back the production, our output of consumer goods only increases by 20 units. This is because the resources that are being freed are less well suited to the production of consumer goods than the resources that were freed in the earlier stages. And finally, whenever we reduce our output by that final uh, 25 bundles of tools, that is when we cut our investment output to zero, we increase our output of consumer goods only 10 more units, up to 180. This is the quantity of consumer goods that we can produce when all of the resources of our economy are diverted into the production of consumer goods. This last set of resources is quite well suited to the production of sewing machines and not very well suited to the production of clothing. That's why we got only a small increase in consumption for a relatively large reduction in investment. So here are five possible combinations of consumer and investment output. This is our production possibilities frontier. But of course you can imagine that we could produce lots of combinations in between. Instead of reducing output by 25 tools, we could reduce it by 10 or 5 or 1 or 0.5. Therefore, if we connect these dots, we get all the possible combinations of tools and consumer goods. That is, all the possible combinations of investment goods and consumption that are possible to produce in our economy given its resource endowment and its technology. So another way of thinking about this is if we want to produce 80 units of clothing, that is 80 bundles of consumer goods, then given our resources and our technology, the most we can produce in investment goods is going to be, it looks like from this picture, about 80 units of investment goods. That is, go up to the production possibilities frontier and see the maximum quantity of investment that you can produce for a given quantity of consumption. Now, this production possibilities frontier tells us several things about economics. That is, we can see many of the basic concepts of economics in this picture. The first thing we can see is the reality of scarcity. That is, there are some combinations of investment and consumption that we'd like to have in our economy that simply aren't possible. For instance, 120 units of consumption good and 100 units of investment that's a point up here that lies outside the production possibilities frontier. This would be a very nice point to achieve, but it's simply not achievable given the resources and the technology that our economy has to work with. So points outside the production possibility frontier indicate the reality of scarcity. Points inside the production possibility frontier, like this one, 40 units of consumption and 50 units of investment represent the possibility of unemployment or underemployment. If we're not using all of our resources or we're using them in uses for which they are not especially well suited, then we're not going to be producing the maximum amount of investment goods that can be produced for a given amount of consumption. So points within the production possibility frontier represent unemployment or underemployment. The downward slope of the production possibility frontier reminds us of opportunity cost. If you want more consumer goods, that is, if you want to move outward on the horizontal axis, you have to move downward on the vertical axis. To get more consumer goods, you have to give up investment goods. There is a trade-off. More of one good means necessarily less of another. And finally, notice that the curve gets steeper as we move down it. 
That's because the slope of the curve represents opportunity cost. Remember from slope, rise over run. In this case, the rise is the reduction in investment goods that's necessary to give you the run or the increase in consumer goods. 25 investment goods given up may buy you 100 consumer goods at one point on the curve, but only 10 consumer goods at another point on the curve. As the curve gets steeper, the opportunity cost of additional consumption is getting larger. That's because not all resources are equally well suited to the production of tools and consumer goods. Some resources are better at tools, and we keep them in the production of tools until the very end. Others are better suited for the production of consumer goods, and we move them into the consumer good production as quickly as possible as we start increasing output in that sector. So the bowed shape, the outward bowed shape of the production possibility frontier indicates increasing opportunity cost. Now, what happens if we change the things we held constant at the beginning of this story? When I drew this production possibility frontier, I held constant the resources of this economy and its technology. What happens if we change one or both of those factors? Well, when you draw this curve, remember, you're holding those things constant. You're saying, what happens to our production of investment goods if we increase our production of consumer goods? Ceteris paribus, that is, holding constant resources and technology. But if you're going to change resources and technology, that is, if you're going to change the original assumptions that were made when you drew the curve, you've got to draw the whole curve over again. When you change those basic assumptions, you've got to go back and redraw the relationship. So let's start with an example. Suppose we have a, an improvement in technology that allows us to produce a lot more tools for a given quantity of consumer goods. That is, suppose there is a technological change that allows us to make tools more simply. Maybe some advance in computer know-how or the discovery of a new mineral that's useful in making tools. And let's suppose that this technological advance applies to the production of tools, but not to the production of clothing. That is, if we use all of our resources in clothing, we can still produce the same quantity of clothing as before. But if we produce tools now, we're going to get more tools than before. That is, the production possibility frontier is going to lie outside the original. Our possibilities have increased, and these increased possibilities favor the production of tools. That is, with these new possibilities, you can make tools more easily than before. Notice the way the curve shifted. The shift is biased in the direction of tools. That's because this technological progress favored the production of tools. The same picture would apply if we got new resources that were useful in the production of investment goods, but not particularly useful in the production of consumer goods. Let's consider another case. What happens to this curve over time? Because, see, this is a dynamic story. If you make the decision to devote some of your society's resource to the production of tools, you're increasing your resource base. If you don't eat everything now and you plant some of it, you're going to be able to grow more food tomorrow. So whenever you make a choice to be at a point like this on the curve, a point that involves a balance between the production of goods for consumption today and goods that can be used as tools to make more goods tomorrow, then your production possibilities frontier is going to shift outwards over time. And we call this outward shift economic growth. That is, as you accumulate tools, you increase your ability to produce output in your economy. And this accumulation of tools advances the production possibilities. It means you can make more of everything over time. This is called economic growth. And we imagine that economic growth is probably no more likely to favor consumption as it is to favor investment. That is, the tools you make will help you make clothing as well as sewing machines tomorrow. So the whole curve shifts outwards. Some economic growth is biased in one direction or another. But in general, there's no reason to assume that the investment in tools doesn't increase your production possibilities broadly, that is, increase your ability to make output in both sectors in the next period. Suppose there is a war that affects this economy. How would the production possibilities change? 
Looking at the diagram, we can imagine that the output in both sectors would be reduced. That is, if war occupied or destroyed some of the resources in this economy, the quantity of consuming and investing goods that can be produced is going to be reduced. So the curve would shift inward like this. How would immigration affect the production possibilities frontier? Suppose talented labor were to find its way into this economy. What would happen? We can show that as an outward shift in the production possibilities frontier, the ability to produce more of all goods than before. What would happen now if a technological change occurred that increased the ability to produce consumption goods but didn't change the ability to produce investment goods? We would show that as a biased shift in the production possibility frontier that increased the possibilities only in one dimension. The production possibilities frontier then summarizes the capability of this economy to produce goods and services. And one interesting thing to notice is that it's possible to talk about the production possibilities frontier in terms of these aggregates. The trade-off between enjoying consumption today and using your resources to make tools so that you can enjoy even more consumption tomorrow.